come, Lord Jesus, like the crowds who laid their coats and palm branches on his path. We shout, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Jesus, Messiah, arrives in a donkey, proclaiming victory, mighty to save. Psalm 21 anticipated him long before his Palm Sunday arrival. The king rejoices in your strength, Lord. How great is his joy in the victories you give. It's a, it's a royal psalm. This, uh, this kind of Psalm 21. As a psalm of David, it was either composed by him or with him in mind. Originally, it likely celebrated a military triumph on the battlefield. The Lord gets the credit and the glory. His, his people were under threat. We don't know the details of that crisis, but they were in grave danger. And the Lord acted to save them. The king is relieved and grateful. His joy overflows, not just for himself, but for his people. Can you rejoice in the strength of the Lord today? His resources are beyond limit, but his power often is, is different than we often imagine. Consider Jesus entering Jerusalem, knowing he will soon be nailed to a cross, hoisted up to die. What strength does the Lord, Yahweh, his heavenly Father, impart to him? How does Jesus draw on his mighty power? Is he already glad, knowing that his pain will lead to victory? Twenty years ago, Pastor Toy Seng traveled to a remote part of northern Cambodia. Most people there practiced Buddhism or traditional spirit worship. Christianity was virtually unknown. One small rural village welcomed Seng with unusual warmth. The people eagerly embraced him and his gospel message. Most didn't waste any time at all accepting Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Seng was kind of blown over by it. It was almost like they'd been waiting for him. And when he questioned them about it, an old woman shuffled forward, bowed, and grasped Seng's hand. She said, we've been waiting for you for 20 years. And then she told him about the mysterious God who had hung on a cross. In the 1970s, the Khmer Rouge, a brutal communist regime, they took over Cambodia, destroying everything in its path. Soldiers descended on this village in 1979. They rounded up the villagers and forced them to start digging their own graves. Now, the people did that. And then when they had finished, they prepared themselves to die. Some screamed to Buddha, others to demon spirits or to their ancestors. One woman, though, began to cry for help based on a childhood memory, a story that her mother had told her about a god who had hung on a cross. Now, facing death, she prayed to that unknown God. Surely, if he knew suffering, he would have compassion on them. Well, suddenly, her solitary cry became one great wail. The entire village began praying to the suffering God who had hung on a cross. Facing their own graves, the wailing slowly turned into quiet crying. An eerie silence settled into that muggy jungle air. Slowly they turned around to face their captors, and the soldiers were gone. The old woman told Pastor Sang that since that humid day 20 years earlier, the villagers had been waiting, waiting for someone to come and tell them more about the God 
who had hung on a cross. Now that story is told in a book called The God Who Hung on the Cross by Doris Rosser and Ellen Vaughn. The king rejoices in your strength, Lord. How great is his joy in the victories you give. Well, who can fathom the joy of King Jesus who brings salvation victory to people who desperately need it? When the original Palm Sunday crowd sang praises to him on his way into the city, they had no inkling their Messiah would suffer an excruciating death on a rough cross. He knew it, though. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he showed up in Jerusalem for that welcome parade. Thanking the Lord for his kindness to the king, the psalmist says, you have granted him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. Well, what was the desire of Jesus as he entered the battlefield ahead of him? Normally, I imagine when a soldier comes under fire, it must trigger an intense longing to survive. That would be my natural focus, I think. What's your desire today? Are there requests that you are earnestly bringing before the Lord? What attacks do you face? Have you asked him for help in this COVID-19 season? Are you stressed about work, about finances, or about family? Call to me and I will answer you, the Lord says. Well, what about Jesus? Surrounded by that adoring crowd so many years ago, what was his desire? Was he scheming to expand his popularity or build his political momentum? Did he obsess about survival? Was he looking to marshal the kind of military support people expected from a Messiah? No. Jesus arrived with a laser-sharp focus on saving us and glorifying his Father in heaven. That, he knew, meant crucifixion. His victory to accomplish his goal of saving us and bringing glory to his heavenly Father. That victory requires the cross. And the Lord granted King Jesus his heart's desire. What astonishing love. How does he do it? What sustains him as he steps closer and closer to that agonizing death? Well, Jesus is completely in sync with his Father's heartbeat. And so he has absolute clarity about who he is and the blessing that he carries. He knows what's at stake. The psalmist, speaking to the Lord about the king, says, you came to greet him with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. Jesus came filled with blessings so that he could be a blessing, so that he could impart blessing to us. Have you ever thought about that? Remember, Jesus is fully God and fully human. As the uncreated Son of God, Jesus has been in perfect communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit for all eternity, unrestrained by time or space, without beginning or end, the three persons of our triune God relate to each other in holy love, always and forever. It's vastly more beautiful and compelling than any of us can imagine. As the Father has loved me, Jesus says, so I have loved you. Incredible. It's incredible. Now, when we consider Jesus, the Son of God, giving his life for us on the cross, there's something we easily misunderstand. Because he's God in the flesh, bearing the fullness of deity, 
there's a danger that we might picture him only as strong, unmovable, invincible, incapable of feeling hurt, rejection, loneliness, or dismay. Crucifixion would not seem like such a great sacrifice then. The old heresy of docetism claimed that Jesus appeared to be human, but that was really an illusion. And that, it's not an illusion. It's a heresy and a lie. Jesus, the Bible testifies, truly and fully walked this earth as a human being. He got tired and thirsty, weak and discouraged. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Yet, he didn't sin. Before he was crucified, Jesus was in anguish, and as he prayed, His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. His battle was real. His sacrifice, costly. As a man, he had to depend on the Father and on the Holy Spirit for everything. They, in turn, filled him with blessings. Now, what were they? Now, we could hardly name them all, but but they include... At the very least, they include gifts of relationship, recognition, and spiritual power. You can see this so plainly when Jesus is baptized. As he comes up out of the Jordan River, he sees heaven torn open and the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And this voice from heaven says, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So this is the foundation of his life and his ministry. Jesus carries these blessings of the Father and the Holy Spirit, not just for himself, but to share with us. We we need these same gifts, relationship, recognition, and spiritual power. Last week, an email from Global Disciples told of a Congolese man named Alex. Alex had been born during a civil war, surrounded by instability and conflict. Two of his older brothers were killed by the rebels. Several younger siblings died from illness and malnutrition. Alex and his family fled to Uganda as refugees. Now, his parents were believers, but these hardships had made Alex bitter and angry with God. Looking back, he says, My heart was bruised. My soul was always wanting and filled with questions. I lost hope for myself and for my future. Now, every person has a unique story, of course, but all of us have experienced some bruising of our heart, some dissatisfaction in our soul, and some questions that don't have easy answers. Jesus knows our pain, He understands us and our deepest needs. We need intimacy with God. We need to know that he recognizes us and approves of us as a precious son or daughter. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, praise God, Alex did find salvation in Jesus, who so eagerly shares the rich blessings of God with us as we turn to him in faith. In sin, we're estranged from God. We're alienated from him. Through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus, though, he forgives us. He restores us. And he welcomes welcomes us home. In In sin, we strive for recognition to prove we're worth something. You know, there's a fascinating incident from the life of David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed. The prophet Nathan confronts David. He confesses his sin. But there are still terrible, terrible consequences. All of this takes place while David's troops are in battle. The king should have been with them, but he stayed home. Near the end of 2 Samuel 12, Joab, the commander of his army, sends messengers to David, saying, I have fought against Rabbah, and taken its water supply. 
Now muster the rest of the troops and besiege the city and capture it. Otherwise, I'll take the city and it will be named after me. In other words, I'll get the credit. Joab, in this kind of moment of grace toward David, suggests he can come, kind of mop things up, and he can take the credit. So that's what David does. With most of the fighting finished, he captures the city, and then, and it says, David took the crown from their king's head, and it was placed on his own head. It weighed a talent of gold, and it was set with precious stones. Well, did David have any right to that crown? No. Not really. Was, was there any true honor in that trophy? No. No, David was reaching for significance. He was taking credit for a victory that was, had really been won by someone else. How often do we do something like this in, in our brokenness, in our desperation for recognition? How often do we strive to be noticed, to be respected, to be honored? Derek Kidner points out that the value of the crown, spoken of here in Psalm 21, the value of that crown derives from the giver rather than the gold. If the creator of this universe gives you a paper crown, that is far more precious than any gold crown that you could dig up on your own. What does the psalmist say? It says, You, the Lord, came to greet him, the king, with rich blessings and placed a crown of pure gold on his head. What a difference it makes when it is the Lord who bestows the crown. As human beings, we need relationship. We need recognition and we need spiritual power. But all of our scheming and snatching will only leave us empty stuck with substitutes and counterfeits instead of the real thing. Jesus longs to share the rich blessings of God with us. The Apostle Paul gives us a glimpse of this in Romans chapter 8. So in the first part of Romans, he has just described the incredible news of the gospel of Jesus who died for sinners in order to save us. And then starting in verse 14, he says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you received, it's the Spirit we receive as we respond to the gospel of Jesus, the Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Through faith in Jesus, we are adopted into his family where we find relationship, where we find recognition, and where we find spiritual power, just as we need. King Jesus does not steal his crown. His father places it on his head. Charles Spurgeon observed that in his suffering, Jesus wore the thorn crown, but now he wears the glory crown. Because he is blessed, we are blessed. There's an extraordinary promise in the New Testament that those who are faithful to Jesus will one day receive a victory crown. There are a few passages that speak of this. James chapter 1, verse 12, for example, says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amazing. Jesus rides into Jerusalem to win this for us. In 
and he receives his heart's desire. The psalmist, again, speaking to the Lord Yahweh about the king, says he asked you for life and you gave it to him, length of days, forever and ever. Now, now when most kings of Judah declared this, they were likely just hoping for a long reign, a long life, seeing the forever and ever part as wishful exaggeration. With Jesus, though, there is not one bit of overstatement or hyperbole in this. For him, these words are like a prophetic signpost pointing toward Easter, when he would conquer the grave. These verses written centuries before he set foot in Jerusalem. Through the victories you gave, his glory is great, and you have bestowed on him splendor and majesty. On Palm Sunday, Jesus is still facing the cross. He knows that, but even as he enters the city, it is a victory parade. Many cannot see it yet, but this humble carpenter rabbi from Galilee who gets hungry, who gets dusty and sweaty, just like the rest of us, he arrives with the glory the splendor and the majesty of the Lord Almighty. Surely you have granted him unending blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the wellspring of blessing. Blessing that is overflowing, abundant, and everlasting. His gladness is for you. The joy he shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit is for you. I don't know what this past week has been like for you emotionally. We're in the thick of COVID-19 upheaval and uncertainty. You may be feeling isolated, discouraged, anxious, or unsure. You know, the gap between where we are and where we want to be can sometimes seem so huge. Like, like that massive chasm between the darkness of the cross and the dawn of resurrection morning. Still, Jesus says, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That includes today. Jesus is leading the way. For the king trusts in the Lord through the unfailing love of the Most High, he will not be shaken. It says in verse 7, the king trusts in the Lord. Will you follow Jesus in this? We don't know how long the coronavirus will disrupt our routines and plans. We, we don't know what other challenges or hardships we'll face on life's journey. We, we also, of course, don't know the, the gifts and the joys that lie ahead either. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, he has his eyes on a prize far greater than anyone else around him can see. He's not there for a quick, cheap, temporary victory. Jesus has eternity in mind. Will you let him lead you deeper into the unfailing love of the Lord Almighty? Will you follow him there? So Psalm 21 begins with a celebration of victories already won, salvation already secured, rich blessings already given. Today, as we look back on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we each have a choice to make. Will I accept his reign? Will I trust him? Will I submit to him? Will I obey him as Messiah and Lord? Because then, as, as we do that, his victories, the salvation won for us on the cross, and all of his rich blessings become ours, become yours, become mine. Now, the psalm isn't finished. Commenting on the next verses, Gerald Wilson observes that the presence of God is a two-edged sword. 
For those who trust in him, God brings, vic- brings blessing and salvation. While for the rebellious who resist his rule, God's coming means judgment. The kings of Judah did battle with so many human enemies, but verses 8 to 12 describe an overwhelming triumph far beyond the scope of any human king. Your hand will lay hold on all your enemies. Your right hand will seize your foes. When you appear for battle, you will burn them up as in a blazing furnace. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath, and his fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth, their posterity from mankind. Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. You will make them turn their backs when you aim at them with drawn bow. The Lord in his mercy does not want any to perish. That is why Jesus died such an agonizing death, to save sinners. We live in the time of God's patience. He is giving time now for the gospel to do its work, giving time for the church to proclaim the message of salvation giving time for his enemies to kneel voluntarily in faith before Jesus, our Savior. But this season will not last forever. Writing in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul describes a time still to come when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Now many of those who plotted against Jesus during his final days in Jerusalem, many still had opportunity to confess their sin and find salvation after he rose from the dead. Since then, countless sinners, thieves, proud religious leaders, ordinary people kind of preoccupied with going about their lives, ordinary people dealing with grief and anger and fear and lust, bank managers, grocery clerks, lawyers, farmers, Nurses, students, those with handicaps, athletes, people from every circumstance and walk of life have found salvation, blessing, victory, and eternal life through Jesus Christ. He's still waiting. The time to trust him is now. Let him wash away your sin. Let him adopt you into his family. Rejoice in his strength. Discover the joy of his presence. Be exalted in your strength, Lord. We will sing and praise your might. Amen. Let it be so.